Is there anybody who's uh, really, I think I, one person I talked to is, but relatively new to the course? Okay, I got two, three, four. Uh, have you studied at all, the four of you? Have you done any reading in the course? Just yes or no? Yeah, some? Okay. Um, well, let me just say a word about the course. Um, the Course in Miracles, I think, is without doubt, and the more you study this, the more you will agree with me, uh, the most incredible document ever to cross the face of planet Earth. Yes. Um, it was uh, given to us. It's a, it's a gift. It came to a woman whose name is Dr. Helen Schuchman, who, uh, who I knew, who I met, I met first in 1973, then she formally introduced me to the Course. Uh, actually five blocks from where we are right now, which is sort of interesting, uh, on 17th Street and just off Park Avenue here. Uh, back in April 20th, 1975, and I've been, the more I work with this, the more I know it's 100% gold. And the more you will realize the same thing. It's just incredible that we have it. Uh, it, it may seem difficult to understand uh, there's a, a, actually a passage here in chapter 22 where it says that our understanding, the reason we have trouble understanding it is our understanding is still like that of a baby. <laughs> you know, that to, to, to take it all in, I mean, to grasp the entirety of what this is saying, what it's saying is that you are divine, that you are already home with God, uh, that you always have been, that you can't help it. <laughs> Uh, but somehow or another, we've uh, wandered off uh, into a dream. Actually, uh, <laughs> you talked yesterday about Bizarro World, and I went and looked that up this morning. I had never heard of that, uh, which sort of describes a little bit about the world that, that we're in. We're in this very strange world. This is not heaven. This is a, there's plenty of room over, over here. Just come around in front, guys. Hey, Mike. Okay, Sorry. it's okay. We forgive you. <laughs> Hi, hon. Yeah, right. Just like talking a little bit about the Course for those who are relatively uh, new to it. In essence, what the Course is saying, and I could say that phrase a lot, in essence what it's saying and say a whole bunch of different things, uh, is that your home is heaven. Uh, actually, you never left heaven. And it's possible to remember heaven. Uh, actually, what's happened is that we uh, decided to leave. Now, why we would decide that is, is kind of crazy. Uh, but what we did is we sort of said, thank you very much, God. I'd rather do it myself. And, and God said, okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, you have free will, and I can't stop you. All right, so... Uh, we've gone off, uh, but God, all, God knows uh, we all are going to come back home again. But that coming back home is something which doesn't happen when you die, although dying can maybe help a little bit. <laughs> By that I mean, you know, one of the things you certainly become aware of when you die is that you're not a body, which is something the Course in Miracles is, is saying uh, all along. But it's really a matter of, of memory. It's, a, it's actually a matter of calling back into the mind what the mind already knows. We already, we, all of us, already know this. So a, a, a good phraseology we use is that we're awakening to the memory of something that we already know. So a word that I like to use a lot is that the process one is of recognizing. Recognizing. So you recognize what you already know. No. Okay. Uh, so chapter 22 is about uh, the nature of the holy relationship, which, it, which we can juxtapose against <clears throat> what the Course calls a, a special relationship. And let's just talk a second about what a special this relationship is, just as a way of review. Actually, almost all of our relationships are special. But the ones that we get hung up on, uh, are the ones in which we have some sort of expectation or anticipation about the way the relationship is supposed to look. 
And then when a relationship doesn't look like the way that we think it's supposed to look with our kids or our mate or whoever it is that we're relating to, our boss, our employees, whoever, the primary people in our lives, then we get to have the opportunity of being upset over the fact that things uh, aren't looking the way that we think that they should look. Um, <clears throat> essentially, what the Course is kind of saying is that we've got everything upside down and backwards, uh, that we are seeing the world. The, the Course is going to talk a lot in this particular chapter about difference and sameness. So when we left, we adopted this other identity, which we call an ego, which as a matter of fact is not real and doesn't even exist. So it's like we've adopted a, it's like we put on a mask. <clears throat> so we put on the mask and then we come into the, <clears throat> the world and we find it very difficult to live in this world because, uh, well, first of all, everybody else is wearing a mask as well. So that's, uh, Ram Dass once said something to the effect of, most of the time we spend most of our, our lives trying to convince each other that the our identity, our personality is on straight. Uh, I didn't quote that exactly right, but that we've, got, that we've got it right, right? We try to convince each other of that. When actually the whole purpose is just to find out who we are. I mean, just to remember who we are in truth, which is that soul or that spirit which actually never left home, but is dreaming that it did, this, this dreaming that it's caught <clears throat> in this very bizarro world, as Paul was talking about it in class yesterday. Right? So it's all a matter of vision, that is, it's all a matter of seeing, and the way the ego sees is the ego sees the outside. So what the ego sees is a world of form. And we see a world of bodies. And all of these bodies look very different because they are. I mean, just look around. All, we're all, there's billions of variations on it, but we're all, we're all very, very different. But the Course is saying that is only exists on the outside. And that's not who you are. It's not, you, it, who you are has nothing to do with what's on the outside. So it's really asking us to begin to become aware, to remember, to recognize who we are inside. The kingdom of heaven is inside you. But the, it is not in your body. It has, in fact, it, is your, it has nothing to do with your body. Because it has nothing to do with uh, the world of form at all. In fact, is in this very first page of the handout that I gave you today, I, I, one of the quotes from this section says, there's nothing so blinding as the perception of form. So the ego is very caught in form. It's very caught in the way things look. That's the primary thing, it, it, how it looks. And it's got to look good. It's got to look right. It's got to fit into our definition of what is supposed to, how things are supposed to look. And then if it doesn't, again, we get to be upset because it doesn't fit into our definition. And we're all throwing these definitions onto the world. And we're all throwing these definitions actually onto each other. But the Course is saying, you know, you don't have to, just below the surface of this strange identity that we, that we have, <clears throat> and the form with which we see each other, we're actually all exactly the same. <laughs> I mean, I'm, we are actually exactly the same. Because this has nothing to do with form. We're now on a wholly different level. We're on a level of, of content. A, a word that I think is the, probably the best word that we could use here for all of us would be love. We're now on the level of love, we're all the same. In God's eyes, we're all the same. And God really, in terms of the Course in Miracles, only sees that part of us which has never left home. God sees us as we are in our wholeness and not in our brokenness. So um, that's why you can't really sin. <laughs> the sin 
uh, only happens within a, in a dream that you have. Very a, not a nice dream, an unpleasant, sometimes a nightmare. Dream the the, the story that Yasko was telling a moment ago about the the woman from Vietnam. I mean, lived in a, a nightmare world, and sometimes we're going through nightmares. Uh, war is hell, as uh, who was it, Stonewall Jackson who said, I think it was. Uh, and but so much of our life is hell because. The ego really sees hell by seeing difference. It, it's, it's almost as though the ego is, is, is set. It's got this set, it's this mind set, which is set for looking for difference. So we're always looking for difference. We always see problems. We're seeking, literally seeks out problems. Uh, wants to find problems, it relishes in finding problems, relishes in seeing there, and then pointing it out and, and talking about it. And then we've got, uh, it's always something, right? I mean, uh, there's always a problem. Uh, some of you are smiling because I, <laughs> I've heard those phrases from your lips. So, <laughs> and it's just the, the insanity of the world. So the Course is really, a really important part of this particular chapter is about reason, a lot about reason. So it's helping us to try to get back to reasonableness, to have a reasonable mind, <clears throat> which is the, really the Holy Spirit's mind. The Holy Spirit thinks within the context of reason. The opposite to reason, the justification, would be what we call insanity. And the ego is insane. Uh, the first insanity is that it's to, to think that it's possible to be separate from God. That's not possible, but we've entertained this insane thought that it, the, the phrase, and I'm sure you all know, that comes up late in the course, into eternity where all was one, there crept a tiny, mad, mad, tiny, mad idea. I wish the Son of God, that's you, remembered not to laugh. It's, this is an absurd, ridiculous idea. The absurd, <coughs> ridiculous idea is that it's possible to be separated from God. It is not possible to be separated from God. But just for a moment, you, me, we, humanity, mankind, entertain this thought. <coughs> and depending on how you want to view historical time, for the past several tens of thousands or millions of years, Several billion of us have been entertaining the same thought. So we now have an opportunity to begin to, through the study, and this is a study. We have to, we have to study this. Uh, because, again, we're like babies in the sense that it, it takes a while to kind of get re-educated, to, re to begin to think. That's why we have these 365 workbook lessons. We are very slowly retraining the mind to stop being focused on the outside world and to start going inside instead. We literally have insight, right? So that we begin to see on another level. This has nothing at all ever to do with anything external. And if you would look at the, the lives of the founders of all of our great religious <coughs> traditions, Jesus does not have one word of ministry until after the 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And then in the scripture it says, after that he began to teach. So he's got 40 days and 40 nights They're just going in, going in, going in, right? Muhammad is sitting alone in a cave meditating when he finally hears recite, recite, he's, he's illiterate, but he can recite what he hears, just like Helen Shukman hears the, the Course in Miracles. There's an interesting similarity between Islam and the Course, and that both of them are saying, although they use different words and different terminology, uh, they're both talking about us following the will of God, in Islam, it's called submitting to the will of God, which sounds a little bit, you got to submit to the will of God, you know. And the Course doesn't use the word submit uh, or surrender. It just asks us to, to demonstrate a willingness 
to follow God's plan. And of course, it's very, very clear that there is a plan. It's all laid out for us. And actually, as you begin to, to study the Course, you'll begin to have insights into the plan. And you begin to have insights into recognizing how the plan is already working in your life, uh, even when you don't know that the plan is working in your life. Uh, there's a section, and it's very near the end, where it says, trials are but lessons presented once again, so where you made a faulty chase, choice before, you can now make a better one, and thus avoid all the pain that your previous choice brought to you. So <clears throat> sometimes we go through these, and it says also that some, you don't realize that sometimes what you think is a regression is actually a move forward. And some, says, and some of the points at which you think that you've made some of your biggest steps forward have actually been a regress. Let's say, for example, that you got a lot of money some, for some reason, right? You inherited it, all right? That looks like a, <clears throat> a wonderful benefit, but it may be not a benefit to you. It may be a setback. Right? So there's, we never know. And you may get an illness, which you think, well, this is a big setback, but then maybe it gives you an opportunity to look at death. And, you know, death is sort of a, can be a, an opener, an eye opener, awakening too. I don't mean that you necessarily die, but even dying is okay because that just helps us to, to wake up a little bit, gives us the opportunity to waking up a, a little bit more. That's what happens when the people have these so many near-death experiences that people report are the, the opportunities to see outside of the framework of the ego, again, which only sees the, the form and only sees the, only sees the outside. Because now something forces you, you are forced in. You have to go in. You know, and then I have a good friend, some of you may know, uh, Dr. Rod Shelberg, who's, uh, uh, he lives in Maine. Uh, he is in charge of three nursing homes and one hospice center. And uh, we got together for a little bit this summer in Maine at a retreat. <clears throat> and I said, how many death certificates do you write a week, and he says about one a day, right? So he's he's there, and he, he <laughs> this is the guy you want with you when you're at this point. So he describing all these different experiences that people go through, and, and how eventually that release comes, and the, and then the kind of bliss and the kind of joy that comes to you once they they, they 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 stop fighting with the ego. The ego is the thing which is resisting the whole process of letting go, because we think that that's who we are. And one of the things, of course, is so very, very clear, this is not who you are. This, this, this body is not, the, I, the Course even says at one point, not for a single instance does the body exist at all. <laughs> it has no eternity in it. See, eternity is the important thing. I'm working on a book right now, the publisher just changed the title on me, it's okay. <laughs> It was, it was going to be called, there's no place like home, but now they, they want to call it eternity in A Course in Miracles. And I know why they want to change it, but it's okay, because it's really about eternity. And eternity is, is, is a kind of awakening that, that we have in which we, we see eternity. Because we are trapped, as, as, as it is, we're trapped in a world, in time. Time is a trap. Course says it's it's a vast illusion, right? We're trapped in a world, in time, in a body, and also in this thing we call a personality that we think is is us, which is also uh, in good part something which we've we made up. That's the mask. We make up the personality. That too, at some point, disappears. But that's wonderful because that, that then, that is the awakening. The awakening is the realization that this thing that I try so hard to juggle and keep up <laughs> in, in the air and to keep awareness of, <clears throat> there will not be a John Mundy in heaven. Okay? And we, we don't take that with us. We don't take that piece of identity with us because that's just, that's just something that's in space and time. That, ha that is very temporal. That's something that we put on, anything that we put a label on, 
you can be sure of some captains, reverends, doctors, that none of us get not get into heaven. Right? <laughs> it doesn't mean any, God doesn't know anything about doctors and reverends and captains and lieutenants. I mean, that's just human junk that we we use to distinguish differences. Right? And the Course is asking us not to see the difference, but to see what makes us the same. And the thing that makes us the same, and you don't have to go very deep to be able to find it, is, is the love. Because the love is there. The love is really there. We've got so many, the Course starts off on the very first page by talking about the whole purpose of the Course is to help us to remove the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. So all we've got to do, and yet it looks like a major job, is to identify the blocks. If we could see where we're blocked, and we begin to set the blocks aside, then we have an experience that's called uh, freedom. Right? The soul longs for freedom. Freedom is the, it's really, really, really important thing because it is, we all do kind of feel as though we're, we're trapped. We're trapped in space-time, we're trapped in jobs that we don't like, we're trapped in relationships that we, we don't like, so uh, you can go right through. Come on. Okay. You're welcome, dear. So let's look at a few passages from, uh, let's, let's go to page two and let's look at the introduction and I will start off by reading part of this and uh, we can stop along the way and talk about it. <clears throat> Take pity on yourself so long enslaved. So obviously the enslavement is the enslavement to the ego and to the identity and to the body and to the form of things. Rejoice whom God hath joined have come together and need no longer look on sin apart. See, again, this is what the, what the ego does is it, it looks on sin. It, 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 I, I said a moment ago, but let me emphasize it. it loves to find sin. By the way, when you, when you read the word sin in the Course in Miracles, you can substitute the word separation, and it'll work just as well. Separation is sin, sin is separation. So we could say, need no longer look on separation. Now, to talk about separation would be to talk about difference. We need no longer look on difference apart. No two can look on sin together, for they could never see it in the same place in the same time. And that's true about not seeing it in the same place in the same time because we both have our, we all have our definitions of what sin is. And what is sinful to one person is not sinful to another, right? You grow up in certain um, South Pacific cultures, certain African cultures, uh, folks may very well walk around naked and nobody thinks anything about it. Uh, but try that in New York City and you can be arrested for indecent exposure. Right? So the definition of what constitutes sin depends so much upon our culture. So sin is a strictly individual perception, seen in the other yet believed by each to be within himself. Now this is a very important point in the Course. The, and we'll be stressing it time and time again. The problem that we see, the problems that we see in the world are really, and this is not something you want to hear, <laughs> are really inside us. Otherwise, you couldn't see it in the world. Otherwise, you wouldn't identify it. So, and, and especially the things that really upset you, right? I mean, you, the things that you really, that irritate you and, and get you, right? And then, then you gotta really look at that. I remember I, once I was uh, talking to Ken Wapnick, who most of you know is, was the leading spokesman for A Course in Miracles, about difficulty I was having with a, a brother. And after, this was a rather lengthy session we had about this, and at the end, near the end of it, we just sort of stopped talking and we're sitting there in quiet and I said, to think that that's inside me. Right? I mean, <laughs> I didn't want to have to, 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 but that's where it was going. It was going to looking at where, why was, why am I so upset about this? 
why is this so distracting? Unless there's something in me that is of that same elk, all right? That therefore, and, and I'm, the fear is that that it'll come out. <laughs> you know, that whatever it is will come out somehow, and I'll get caught up in that same sort of compulsive behavior, or addictive behavior, or something like that, right? <clears throat> and each one seems to make a different error, and one the other cannot understand. Brother, it is the same, made by the same. So it, it doesn't matter what the error is. The fact that I'm saying that there's a sin or an error or a problem in the world, that's the problem. The problem is in, a fi in finding problems. That's the problem. But again, as I said, the ego loves to find problems. And you probably all know of, uh, actually a fellow once wrote an article for Miracles Magazine, uh, Dr. Ed Spath, who passed uh, earlier this year. And he was writing about an aunt of his who had died some years ago. And the article was titled, Ain't It Awful? <laughs> And it was about an aunt of his who, that was her favorite phrase, ain't it awful, right? And how he couldn't, there was just no way, that she, that her whole life, that was her, the only way that she really could talk was in terms of ain't it awful. Well, there's plenty that's awful out there if you want to go looking for it, right? We're trying to do, in this chapter it talks about going the other way. We're trying to go the other way. So let's finish this little paragraph. The holiness of your relationship forgives you and your brothers, undoing the effect of what you both believed and saw. And with their going is the need for sin gone with them. So we're changing it. We're changing around to a holy relationship. Let's look over on to, just for a moment, on the bottom of three. And let's look at what a, about a, read about a holy relationship. So... A holy relationship starts from a different premise. Each one has looked within and seen no lack. No lack in the other, right? Accepting his completion. And you know, the more that you feel this completion in yourself, then the easier it is to see the completion in the other. Even if there's something that's a little strange about the other, you can look past it and see the sameness that's there, right? He would accept it by joining with another whole as himself, because we're all whole. He sees no difference between these selves, for differences are only of the body. Another way to say that is that differences are only on the outside. And the body is the most obvious thing that appears to be on the outside, right? Therefore, he looks on nothing he would take, he denies not his own reality because it is the truth. Just under heaven does he stand, but close enough not to return to earth. Now, this is where you should actually be as a Course in Miracles student. Now, what I mean by that is when it says, just under heaven does he stand, uh, you should begin to realize that, that, that that's your position. You are standing just under heaven. You're getting closer. You're getting closer all the time because it, as, you attack, as you, the insanity begins to dissipate and to go away, the blaming, the attack thoughts begin to dissipate and go away. You're not quite in heaven yet. You're not, you're not enlightened yet. It's not 100% yet, but you're getting closer. You know, you're getting, and you should be able to, to have this, uh, uh, a, the Course calls about what it calls the attraction of God. The attraction, and the attraction of God is actually seductive. I mean, it should be seductive. It should be a, a, a pull. There's something that's, which is why you're here. It's what you're doing here this afternoon. You're here this afternoon because you, you've been seduced <laughs> by this book <laughs> into thinking that this can actually help you get all the way home. And it can it's a, it's a positive form of seduction. You know, I mean, it, this is gonna this is gonna work. This is gonna get you there if you are willing to do what it's asking you to do. But that's the you got to be willing to to do what it asks you to do. 
Helen Shugman, who scribed the course, keep in mind this was actually written for Helen and for Bill, her companion in the production of the course, at one point said, this stuff isn't working. And Jesus said to her, well, why don't you try it? <laughs> you know, why don't you, why don't you do what I'm asking you to do? <laughs> you know, you, you haven't, you haven't, you, You've got it. I mean, she intellectually, she had it. Helen could teach the course very well, right? She knew what it said. But there still remained that last little leap into the total acceptance of the uh, atonement. And I, m most of you who have been here before know that I, I'm con personally convinced that Dr. Ken Wapnick had completed the atonement before he passed, and that Bill Thetford had completed the atonement before he passed. Even Helen, I think in the last day, accepted the atonement before he passed, but Ken and Bill really had much earlier, earlier than that. It made the complete transition, right? Let's go to page six. I want to read you what it says there about what a holy relationship is or what a relationship means. <clears throat> so, a holy relationship means joining with another in our mind. Now, when we say th there's nothing physical about this, okay, the course of minds can join, bodies cannot. So on the level of mind, we can join. And whenever we, f whenever we have that experience of, of, of the sameness or, or one-mindedness, it's really a, a beautiful experience, and partly that, that, that may happen when you're falling in love, that you're, it, it can happen any time, any place, but in that kind of a situation, you're, you may be more aware of it, you may see it a little bit more clearly, right, that it's, that it's there for you. Okay. Going on, a holy relationship is a relationship in which we place no judgment, period. No judgment. Hard to do, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, that's the that's the challenge. Is it, maybe you can understand it a little bit better. Some, uh, one good way to understand it is as a parent, if a child does something that's not quite right, uh, you continue to love the child even though the mistake has uh, has occurred. All right, we're not we're not judging it. Going on. A holy relationship is the expression of the holy instant in the, the world. We'll talk in a moment about what a holy instant is. A holy relationship is a relationship in which we extend our forgiveness to the point that what we thought a problem no longer exists. There's a wonderful line in the Chorus where it says, the holiest spot on earth is where an ancient hatred has become a present love. The holiest spot on earth. Another, and that is the miracle. The miracle has occurred at the point at which an ancient hatred has become a present love. A whole relationship is a process by which anyone we see as separate joins with us in the mind through the vision of Christ, which sees beyond the body to the spirit that's our true identity. And then a little definition of the holy instant Holy instant is this instant and every instant in which we choose forgiveness instead of guilt, a miracle instead of a grievance, and the Holy Spirit instead of the ego. Right. I once before in a previous class sort of compared uh, holy instants with uh, a mystical experience. A mystical experience in that sense being an experience of, of unity, an experience of oneness, an experience where we, where we transcend the, for some reason, which we don't always know why, uh, we do set the ego aside. And we, we look upon the world without the eyes of the ego. Uh, actually, what the Course is trying to get us to do is to be able to, to practice doing that more and more and more and more so that it, it becomes uh, that you don't, you don't have just a holy instances once in a while but it becomes a, a more of a, a consistent view, a consistent way of seeing the world that doesn't just 
pop in on occasion. Um, let's then go back to page uh, four. And let's look at what it says out at the bottom. Let's think what a whole relationship can teach. Here is a belief in difference undone. Here is the faith and difference shifted to sameness. I think sometimes when we think about sameness, it sounds like that's pretty dull. Uh, that must be kind of boring, the, the sameness. But actually, it's quite the opposite of that. I mean, don't we take delight in finding someone who thinks like we do? <laughs> I got a, some of you know Alan Cohen, or, uh, author, writer? So I had read one of his books, his next book, which is going to be a really, it's going to be a bestseller, I know it. It's called A Course in Miracles Made Easy. And a lot of people want to know about how to make it easy, right? So. <laughs> But it's a good book. It's a very, very good book. I wrote a glowing review of it in all, in all honesty. And then he wrote back a note about just how fun it is as we get older uh, to find the same friends along the path that we can you know, share these ideas that we know as a true brother or a true sister. You know, that it's just there is no problem. There is no difficult. There is no difference. We don't see the difference. We just, we just see the sameness. Yeah, and that's, that's a beautiful experience. Let me go a little bit further with this. And here is the side of difference transformed to vision. Reason can now lead you and your brother to the logical conclusion of your union. <clears throat> Again, let's talk about you know, reason. We, it's juxtaposed against insanity. Another word that we could use besides insanity is madness. Now, think about that, the madness. Uh, mental institutions used to be called insane asylums or, or madhouses, right? And what happens when you're, when you're, you're mad? I mean, you're, you are attacking. My wife and I were walking down the street in uh, Ventura, California, one day this past summer, just uh, sort of killing some time before going out to dinner with some friends. And this woman walked up to my wife on the, the street and yelled an obscenity at her, all right? And then kind of turned and went, went away. And I immediately looked at my wife's name, Dolores. I looked at Dolores and I said, you know, honey, that wasn't meant for you. <laughs> and she says, yeah, I know. And it wasn't directed at her. It was just, it wouldn't have made any difference who the woman had walked up to an attack. It was just, she was in the attack mode. You see, and I, and you, I couldn't help but feel sorry for her because that's, she was insane. And I'm sure that she did that to another person as she walked down the street and another person. That's just... The problem is out there in the world, and she has so adopted that mode <clears throat> that I saw there were several, I don't know, insane people around there. That's not, I don't know why that was true. Maybe there, but there were. <laughs> I'm not saying anything about Ventura, California. Uh, <laughs> there, there, maybe there's an institution nearby, and they can just go out. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> am I getting myself into trouble here? <laughs> yes. I used to go out to San Francisco to visit a, an old friend, a friend of the family. And yeah, so, take the mic. I'm yeah. sorry, we're on. And twice it happened that I took the same bus, um, two years apart, and I got on the bus, and a few blocks later, an older woman got on the bus, and started hitting me over the head with her umbrella. <laughs> and it was the same woman. And I was two years um, what is it about you, Amy? <laughs> and the first time, um, the bus driver said, oh, don't worry about it. You know, she's just one of the crazy ladies going to the hospital. And, and uh, so yeah. I didn't. Good. Uh, but I don't know what it was about me that triggered it. <laughs> <laughs> you reminded her of somebody or something. Right, you can just hold on to that for a moment. Somebody else? You hold on to that, Lily. Just, just hold on. Oh, lily cats? <laughs> All right. 
Let me finish this, and then we're going to take a break here in a minute. Um, okay. Well, let me start back with reason. Reason now can lean, lead you and your brother to the logical conclusion of your union. That re that's, what you, that's what reason should see. It must extend as you extend when you and he joined. It must reach out beyond itself as you reached out beyond the body to let you and your brother be joined. And now the sameness, and I, the, the love, that you saw extends and finally removes all sense of difference so that the sameness, again the love, that lies beneath them all becomes apparent. Here is the golden circle where you recognize the Son of God for what is born into a holy relationship can never end. And again, if you think about <clears throat> falling in love, one of the reasons that we fall in love can be because the <clears throat> you drop the mask. I mean, you drop, you see the innocence. Love sees the innocence. You see the wholeness. Love sees the wholeness. And it doesn't make any difference where we're, where we're looking. If you can see the innocence, and you can see the wholeness, then that, that pulls us in. This, you know, it's like um, <clears throat> a baby. You know, if you have a baby put into your arms, you can't, you can't look at the baby without going, oh, you know, kind of, you're just a, sort of immediately pulled in by the innocence and the wholeness that's, that's there. At 13, you may not see that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, <laughs> In the infant, you can see it, right? Let me stop, see if there's any questions. That I, we have five minutes before we're going to take our break here, but let me just see if I've been talking constantly for the last 40 minutes or so. Good talk. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Any questions or observations? Yeah, okay, hand her the mic. I'm sorry, we got to, this is for the Hi, video. Hi, I'm Don. Okay. Hey, Don. Um, just speaking about religions, and, you know, we're going into Rosh Hashanah tomorrow, and... Mm. Um, you know, I, I studied something, Judaism, mm -hmm. and, you know, a lot of religions that I've moved away from have this obsession about oh. looking at the sin. Right. And, you know, for me and what brought me to the Course was how I knew inside how that didn't feel good. And I just was very curious as to what, you know, your thoughts around that. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, there, there can be a positive quality to that. It, it's not so much that we're identifying the sin and saying, isn't that terrible, isn't that sinful? But to look inside myself, as, remember what I said again, to think that's inside me? To look at the places where I, maybe I need to do some cleansing. Uh, purification is a very, the principle number seven, I'm not principle number, the, from the, but yeah, principle number seven, from the 50 miracles principles, Miracles are everyone's right, but purification is necessary first. So in order to make room for the miracle to occur, there often is a kind of cleansing that has to take place. So if you look at it in the positive sense, it's not that we're saying it's sinful or it's awful. It's just that we're demonstrating a willingness to look at the stuff that we've repressed, that we've denied, that we've buried, that we haven't been willing to look at, uh, this was Freud's great discovery, by the way. I mean, one of Freud's really great discoveries was how much stuff we repress, how much stuff we, we bury, how much stuff we don't want to, to look at. <laughs> I got a letter yesterday from the IRS. <laughs> and I held that for a moment. I think, do I want to open this? <laughs> you know, and there was just that moment of, oh, my God, you know, what is this? You owe us $253. Oh, God, thank you. We will pay that <laughs> right away. <laughs> we can live with $253, right? So, so it is. Okay. Uh, Billy. Uh, Billy, you need a mic. Um, is there a mic on that side of the room? We only got one mic. There should be another one. There should be one. We'll find Hello? it. Hello? Yes, right. Uh, That's right I just here. want to get clear with you, John. Um, I got a supervisor, he's also a preacher, and I always say to him, remember, the, the storm is inside you, not outside you. But that drives him crazy. He said, it's not in the Bible, he's looking through the book and all that. <laughs> you know, like, I want to clarify, is it in the Bible or is it like... Not you know, to my knowledge. Is it related to like Jesus is in a storm? You know, 
There's this, you know, when they're in the storm, they yeah, wake I know. them up. I know the storm, but I don't know that that relates well, to where, this where topic. That shouldn't cause a miracle, though, right? It says, like, the storm is inside you, not outside, sure. right? Right. I just wanted to clarify. That the Course is always trying to help us, that everything that's going on is going on on the level of mind. So if, if I'm mad, if I'm angry, if I'm attacking, if I'm projecting, if I'm finding fault with the world, it's in me. It's never in you. I, it doesn't make any difference what it is. Even if you have done something, the question still would be, why is it that I'm projecting about that? Can you imagine Jesus getting upset with the disciples because they weren't getting it? You know, I mean, because they weren't understanding what he was trying to, te to teach? That would not be sanity. The Course is trying to help us to be sane, to be reasonableness and patient. And sometimes it takes a lot of patience. Right? The thing you want to do, the way you, we teach the Course, is just by living the Course out loud in front of someone. About, out loud, I mean it's not that you're saying anything or doing anything. But unlike the poor lady on the street in Ventura, you know, you, it's completely the opposite of that. So the, what, you, what one is radiating isn't madness or insanity, but you're just radiating this very simple love that's there regardless of what's going on in the world. And that's a challenge, just to be able to do it regardless of what's going on in the world. Right? But you can. Hey, John. Yeah. Does it, isn't it in the beginning of this chapter where it says, the world that we are looking at, everything outside, is an outward picturing of an inward Inner condition. condition. Right. So, you know, what that says, and what that says to me is, everything that the eyes are beholding outside in the world of form is an inward thought within the mind projected outward for me to witness. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. I see that some of you came in after we started. If you, We're going to take a break now. If you would like to check with our registrants here uh, during the break. I appreciate that. And see you in 10 minutes, okay?